good. Now you get to give the first reading. I do. I'm which looking is, forward to this Oh, one. yes. <laughs> which is from the book of Proverbs. Mm -hmm. The last chapter of the book of Proverbs. Sorry. Yes, there's Thank one. you. And it's the, um, the good wife. So Proverbs 31, verses 10 to 31. Here we go. <laughs> a capable wife who can find. She is far more precious than jewels. The heart of her husband trusts in her, and he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not harm all the days of her life. She seeks wool and flax and works with willing hands. She is like the ships of the merchant who brings her food from far away. She rises while it is still night and provides food for her household and tasks for her servant girls. She considers a field and buys it. With the fruit of her hands, she plants a vineyard. She girds herself with strength and makes her arms strong. She perceives that her merchandise is profitable. Her lamp does not go out at night. She puts her hands to the distaff and her hands hold the spindle. She opens her hands to the poor and reaches out her hands to the needy. She is not afraid for her household when it snows, for all her household are clothed in crimson. She makes herself coverings. Her clothing is fine linen and purple. Her husband is known in the city gates, taking his seat among the elders of the land. She makes linen garments and sells them. She supplies the merchant with sashes. Strength and dignity are her clothing and she laughs at the time to come. She opens her mouth with wisdom and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. She looks well to the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and call her happy, her husband too, and he praises her. Many women have done excellently, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Give her a share in the fruit of her hands and let her works praise her in the city gates. Hear the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. She's a busy bee. <laughs> She's a busy woman. She set the bum way up here. <laughs> yes. um, well, look, that's right. I mean, I know, you know, people say today that, you know, you used to have certain expectations of women now, and then, you know, women had to be professional, have jobs, and now they've sort of got to be both. They've got to be super mums and super professional and do everything but the precedent set back here isn't it i mean it's, this woman does yes, everything. absolutely she's incredibly skilled person well it's interesting because we're very conscious that proverbs as a book of its time is written in a very patriarchal context mm. it's a book written for men mm. and this is illustrated by the fact that um, a good wife who can find this is the this yes. is the end of the book this is the last piece of advice they're giving to young men most of whom are sort of men in the court, men trying to get ahead, men trying to climb the corporate ladder, if you like. Um, and the, the crowning piece of device they give here is find the right partner. Yes. You know, so there's wisdom in that. Yes, there's wisdom in that. But it's interesting too that in as much as she's, she's in a very constrained sort of role, well, she's sort of looking after the household while the husband's at the gate. But she's doing so much <clears throat> more than that. Yes, though. that's the point. She's doing more. I mean, the husband at the gate, the gate is the court. Yes. So presumably he's sort of, in other words, in government. Mm. She's not in government, but she's not just at home cooking no. the meals either, is she? She trades. She considers a field and she buys it. Yeah. She so trades she, wool and flax. That's right. Yeah. She, she, she manages doing, the household. She's, she's doing something with the merchants as well. She's like a ship coming with spices from yes. a foreign field, which suggests there's a level of mystery to she the makes, way she operates. She makes all her own clothes. I just, I can't read yeah, any just, more of this. Absolutely. <laughs> <clears throat> <clears throat> yeah, I, I don't think the point is, it's not a work ethic for women. <laughs> I'm so glad. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, these things have in the past been taken out of context, haven't they? Yes, um, but it, it's, but yes, sorry, and I don't mean to cut you off, but um, I'm thinking it's not advice for women. It's advice for men. Yeah. So And the Get advice a good one. for <laughs> Get a good one, but recognise, I mean, recognise that a, a, a good woman is, it can be extremely capable. I mean, in, that's a that's a powerful point, I yes. think, in, in context. She's not changed the kitchen sink, this woman. <laughs> no, 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 no. She, she's, uh, she takes initiatives. Yes. Um, she's got her own slaves. And she has the freedom <laughs> to do that as well, which I don't know, I can't speak for this time, but. 
she's, well, I think that's the point. Yeah. The yeah. point is that you know her partner, they they have a mutually supportive kind of relationship exactly. here, exactly. right? And she can yeah. do all of these things. Um, yeah. yeah, it doesn't say whether she wants to do them or not, does it? But um, nonetheless, she has a lot of freedom here. Yeah, and she gets a lot of affirmation in return. Her children rise up and call her blessed. Her husband as well praises her, you know what I mean? So she's a powerful figure mm. in her own right, much mm. admired, mm. capable, mm. taking initiative. Mm. Uh, in its context, it's a... Uh, say, particularly given that this is the climax of the Book of Proverbs. Yeah. It's a powerful testimony Yeah, to the fact that uh, men and women both had vital contributions to make to the community of Israel. Yes. Yes. Mm. Mm. Nicely done. We'll try our second reading. Second readings from the letter of James. I think it was not our last reading from the letter of James, I think, but we're well into it. I think we have one more week. One more. Mm. We're going from James chapter 3, verse 3 to 4, 3, uh, four, sorry, verse 13, 4, 3, 7, 8. Okay. Who is wise and understanding among you? Show by your good life that your works are done with gentleness born of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not be boastful and false to the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from above, but is earthly unspiritual, devilish. For where there is envy and selfish ambition, there will also be disorder and wickedness of every kind. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without a trace of partiality or hypocrisy, and a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace for those who make peace. I'm just going to continue on here. Those conflicts and disputes among you, where do they come from? Do they not come from your cravings that are at war within you? You want something, you do not have it, so you commit murder. You covet something, cannot obtain it, so you engage in disputes and conflicts. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly in order to, to spend what you get on your pleasures. Adulterers, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you suppose that it is for nothing that the scripture says God yearns jealously for the spirit that he has made to dwell in us? But he gives all the more grace. Therefore, it says God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be, Thanks to, be God. to God. I may have left the last word, verse out there to cleanse your hands, but you get the gist, I yeah, think, don't you? I think it goes to 8a, so... Um, okay, um, yeah, cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts. Do not be double-minded. As I say, we're just finishing off Proverbs, and James is the closest we get to wisdom literature in the New Testament. And you get that at the beginning. Show your good life. The works are done with gentleness, born of wisdom. Uh, the wisdom James talks about, though, is very much that sort of um, upside-down wisdom that Jesus teaches. It's not about getting and grabbing and getting ahead mm. is it i mean you on the contrary he says you know this is where all the problems start we want stuff we, we don't have mm. you know so we we kill people we we uh, climb all over people we mm. we get in conflicts and disputes uh, we don't have it we don't ask for it when we do ask for it we ask it wrongly because it's coming from the wrong motives so yeah there's a contrast as there is in the book of proverbs between godly wisdom mm and sort of worldly mm. wisdom and uh yeah for james indeed to be the friend of the world is to be the enemy of god that's mm. a strong statement it is a strong statement 
I mean, it reflects, yes, that James sees the world as a scary place, which... Um, yeah. He's, what did they say on one of the commentaries we were listening to? He's freaking out. He's free, <laughs> he's actually freaking out, they reckon, at this point, because he can see how the world that is infringing on the, the true call of followers of Jesus. And um, basically saying, you know, if you, if you have faith, then it needs to be something that is seen. You know, it needs to be... Yeah, real and tangible, but it also, tangible, you know, yeah. that's going to get you... In, it's going to get you into trouble. Um, mm. And, you know, this is um, the reality. This is, um, we assume, James, the brother of Jesus, James, who was the leader of the early church in Jerusalem. James, who I believe was martyred, oh, I can't remember the exact year, but quite possibly not long after he writes this. Um, both Jameses are martyred. We read early in Acts, I think it is, that Herod had James, the brother of John, beheaded. But the, the, there are multiple accounts, I was looking them up this morning, of the uh, martyrdom of this James as well. Mm. Um, in fact, there are six accounts of the martyrdom of James, which is more accounts than mm. of the death of Jesus. Mm. <laughs> there are four. Um, the, the tradition, I think, which goes back to Josephus and, and echoed by the other early writers, is that he was thrown down off the temple that he was speaking there and they threw him down okay. and then and then that didn't kill him so they clubbed him to death on the yeah. ground so it's a horrible um, mm. uh, uh, finish but it reflects the fact that the world was a scary place I mean, I mean the truth is now the world is still a scary place mm. it seems like a scary place mm. at the moment yes yes maybe particularly at the moment yeah. uh, and what's James answer to that not to run from no, the world to, but to engage with integrity yes to live live your faith yeah to live it out that's yeah. right live it out publicly tangibly yes uh, courageously even though the world is pulling you in a completely opposite direction yes yes that's right and you've got to make that choice mm. because to be the friend of the world is to be the enemy of god it's mm. an extreme way of putting it but i wonder whether it's a choice that we make every day you know because that pull is so strong we we need to make that every day yeah I'm, i mean this is worth fleshing out isn't it because when we think of if you like worldly wisdom versus the sort of spiritual wisdom we're reading of here and which is there in the book of proverbs and which is going to be uh, also embodied in our gospel reading in a moment mm. the contrast is very great isn't it there mm. is the, the sort of wisdom which is pushed in the media which is about grabbing and getting and getting ahead mm. and there's the um wisdom from above which is about serving mm. yes perhaps that's a good introduction mm. for the gospel yeah we'll stand Holy Gospel is written the ninth chapter of the Gospel according to Mark, beginning at the 30th verse. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. They went on from there and passed through Galilee. He did not want anyone to know it, for he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, the Son of Man is to be betrayed into, into human hands, and they will kill him. And three days after being killed, he will rise again. But they did not understand what he was saying and were afraid to ask him. Then they came to Capernaum, where he was in the house. When he was in the house, he asked them, What were you arguing about on the way? But they were silent, for on the way they had argued with one another who was the greatest. He sat down, called the twelve, and said to them, Whoever wants to be first must be the last of all and the servant of all. And then he took a little child and put it, um, put it among them. And taking it in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. This is the Gospel of the Lord. 
Praise to you, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. Okay, I mean, there's, there's, a, there's a, a lot in this um, passage, and I know you've preached on this already today, focusing on the child, but um, it, it's also the, the um, Jesus, what second prediction? Uh, where he tells them plain, plainly about mm. he's going to suffer, he's going to die. And uh, every time this happens, it sort of brings the worst out of the disciples, doesn't mm. it? <laughs> they, they just don't. They, they do don't, not understand. They don't understand. They don't want to hear it. It's too confronting. It's extraordinary, isn't it? And I guess that's because there's a dominant narrative. Yep. Mm. And people and everyone has bought into that dominant narrative. Mm. And it's very hard to break with that, you know, if you've been convinced. Which is that the Messiah is going to be some mighty leader that's going to come and. Is well, that yes, what you're the, the, yeah. well, that you know, as uh, Tom Wright says, forgiveness of sins was almost synonymous with ending the Roman occupation. Mm. It was another way of saying it. You know what I mean? Mm. That's what, as as a God fearing Jew, that's what you're looking to God for. You know, it's not your forgiveness of your personal sins you know that's not irrelevant but it's it's ending of the bloody occupation and i mean bloody in the full sense of the word it's a horrendous and painful occupation and that's what they're looking for god to solve and that's what they're looking for jesus to solve and when peter says you are the christ he's he's um uh, designating jesus rightly as the one who's going to end that occupation and so this talk of, you know, I'm going to suffer, I'm going to die, it's just, it just doesn't fit the narrative. And I mean, into that, into that narrative that's going on in their head of violent overthrowing of power, I am going to mention the child. Jesus brings the I'm, child. I'm, we're getting to the child. <laughs> Jesus brings a child into that. And you could not have a more different two more different images well this is completely right and in between those two you've got this argument that the disciples are having that who is the greatest sorry it's hard which to, is very childlike it, very childlike <laughs> it's hard not to laugh because i mean it's for god's sake um you know how wrong can they get it is it's just jesus tells them this they can't hear what he's saying the dom narrative is too strong so they go back to arguing about who's the greatest i mean it's hard to know exactly what form that conversation talk were they talking about i'm bigger than you i could beat you up if i wanted to or you know more likely you know when we're in power i'm the one who's going to be in charge of the treasury because i know what's going on I, you know yeah. whatever it is it's just it's and just then saying, jesus comes in and says what are you arguing about and they go nothing nothing <laughs> nothing <laughs> we weren't arguing many of us have been in those situations with children yeah. haven't well we? this is it that as you say it is very childlike mm. but I wonder whether that's a de deliberate thing the writer does here in that the, the, there is a physical child that Jesus ends yes. up bringing in their midst and the, and the disciples are behaving in a very traditionally childlike yes but the, the point way. of the point of the child is very different from the way in, from the the childlikeness of the child Jesus brings in is not the child mm. coming out in the disciples mm. <laughs> it's a, no it's it's a different sort of child Although um, I think we can over sentimentalize. Okay, good point. Good point. You know, I think we can say, oh, you know, Jesus picks a child because children are innocent and children right. are good. That's but right. I think if we do that, we miss the radical nature of this and, image. Yes, Jesus, and let, let's Jesus look at exactly what Jesus is saying with the child here, because this is not the, we, we can easily conflate all the appearances of the children in the Gospels. This is not the only. This is not yes. let the children come to be, do no. not hinder them. No. Uh, this is not become ye as a little child. This is, you know. This is, if you want to see God, look here. Okay. Yeah, this is, the, the one who welcomes this child welcomes me. Welcomes me. This is what power looks like. Vulnerability. Well, is it what power looks like or is it that we don't? God's power. Okay, yeah, all right. Not the power that they're used to. He's freaking them out at every turn. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, in what sense is a child powerful? That's the point. Okay. I think is that a child represents the most vulnerable in I mean, our society. Yes, and particularly even more so in that society where children were of very little value. Mm. 
Yeah. You know, if, if anything, we... And in many parts of our world today, children are of very little value, value and not protected and... True, whereas we tend to worship our children yeah. which are at the other end. In some sections of our yes. community, yeah. Well, I do. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, so what's what's the point of the child? I mean, initially it's a response to the, we are the greatest, you know, yes. I'm the greatest yes. thing, isn't it? And Jesus says, you want to be the first, you've got to be the last, you've yes. got to serve. Yes, if you want to see God, I mean, that's my interpretation of it. If you want to see God, look right here. So what is that saying to us about God and God's power? That there's a vulnerability there. It's yes. not what you think it is. Yes, because Jesus goes beyond simply illustrating what they're supposed to be like with the image of the child. He also then says, mm. the person who welcomes mm. the child welcomes me. There's mm. an identification mm. with the vulnerable. Yes which again is played out through the Gospels, isn't it? Yes, whatever you do for the least of these, you yes, do for me. Yes, and I think that's its not an easy thing to get our heads around. I mean, I think I still haven't really got my head around. No, we're, we're coming back to the, the wisdom of the wisdom of God, which is there in the Proverbs and there in the book of James and here on display again, mm. is very different to the wisdom of the world. Mm. And the wisdom of the world is all about being great mm. and, and powerful, which means being able to lord it over others and, mm. um, you know, inflict our will on other people. Mm. And uh, to get ahead by trampling on those people. Yeah, um. yeah. Whereas Jesus says, you're going to be first, you've got to be the last mm. of all, the servant of all. Mm. I mean, we don't want to romanticise that because it's, it's the sort of thing that gets you trampled on and killed. Mm. Yeah. Which is what happened to James mm -hmm. <laughs> and what happened to Jesus. When you live that out, to... when you live that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, no wonder they can't hear it. Mm. No. <laughs> Maybe we still can't hear it. No. Um, Maybe we still don't really know what that means. Yeah. I mean, I heard, again, one of the commentators making the good point that Jesus is letting the disciples know that their time together is not going to end well mm. and um, no one wants to hear that no no you don't want to it's hear like that. going into a, like a married relationship or something isn't it and someone yes, going and this is not going to this end, is only, what, what this end is going well to end violently. yeah and you go <laughs> no it's not no it's not it's going to end deeply, happily deeply ever after other. yeah yeah no this is going to end violently at the, the point that the commentator was making was that you know uh, today a lot of churches, you know, are under threat and things are difficult and that shouldn't surprise us. Mm. Jesus mm. kept telling us, you know, it ain't going to end well. Mm. <laughs> There's going to be bloodshed mm. and uh, it's going to be mm. difficult. Mm. And we've got to anticipate that and be ready for that. And um, You know the question I'm wondering, don't you? Where's the good news in this? Because oh, at the point. moment, I'm kind of looking at the cross going, oh, holy moly. I, I look, for me, part of the good news is actually recognising that when things are really bad, that that's not really bad, if you know what I mean. Right, okay, <laughs> that we're on the right track. That, yes, exactly. Uh, and contrary to the world's wisdom, if yeah, you like, yeah. which says that if you're poor and in trouble and people are after you, you're obviously doing something wrong. Yeah. It actually suggests no. If you're poor and in trouble and people are after you, you're probably doing something right. Mm. And that in itself um, is good news. I mean, and this maybe is... you're nearer to nearer to God in in that place, and you're nearer to living out living out the kingdom in, in that place. Well, and look, this is the ambiguity of the of the cross itself, which is a symbol of, of pain. Mm. But at the same time, beyond Jesus the pain, rises. a symbol of hope. Yeah, mm. I, can, mm. I can live with that. Yes, yeah, so I think in a sense what these passages do for us is legitimise our pain. If you like, make us realise it doesn't mean we're on the wrong track. Mm. Mm. We're struggling, mm. but that's what we should have anticipated. And, and there is hope. 
Yes, because the kingdom of God will come and every mm. tear will be wiped away and the earth will be as full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. That's still the big picture, but not yet. 